watching the news and the world is somewhat in a little bit of a state of flux right now, like I've been talking about. Things are changing rapidly. 2020 is becoming a very interesting year and we're not even halfway through it yet. I love a meme that I saw on Facebook. It shows a individual looking into the into the distance and they're squinting and the words above it and says what chapter of revelation are we living in this week so you know it's it's very interesting to see how things are developing and as i was contemplating the sermons contemplating the fact that there are people who are watching these videos that are not part of our church family and they are experiencing a probably a different sort of impact than what we are. So not only do I want to preach a sermon that is relevant to us, I want to preach a sermon that is relevant to them as well. So what it will encourage us also encourages those that might be watching the video, which I'm hoping this sermon does encourage you. Now... <clears throat> What I want you to do is I want you to go back in your mind, in your imagination. We're going to go to a city called Thessalonica. And there's some interesting things about this city. Number one, it's very wealthy. It's not the largest city in the Roman Empire, but it is very wealthy because it is the gateway for trading, for land trading, when you want to go from Europe to Asia, and specifically Asia Minor. And if you want to go from Asia Minor to Europe, to Italy, and, and places of interest there, you've got to go through Thessalonica. Now, if you're going by sea, you go through Corinth. But if you're going by land, you go through Thessalonica. So it's a huge marketplace. If you are living there before... Paul came to start his church, most likely you will be pagan. And what that means is that the men, and sometimes they bring their wives, they are members of the various pagan temples. And there's quite a number in Thessalonica. And what they do on Friday nights, they come together for a great big meal and they conduct business. And this is an established part of life. In Thessalonica, the pagan temples form a very important part of society. And there's certain activities that, well, we're not going to talk about today. But let's just say that morally they were rather loose in that city as well. And they saw that as part of their pagan worship. Another interesting thing that I discovered as I was doing research... Thessalonica has fast food joints. Now they don't have McDonald's, which is really surprising, but they have fast food joints. And a lot of people don't really enjoy cooking at home. So you go to the marketplace and you go to a fast food joint and you select your food and you eat it there, but you eat it standing up. And uh, there, there's no place really for you to sit. You, you eat standing up at this high table. So it's, it's fascinating what life is like. And then one day, the Apostle Paul makes an appearance. And he begins a church, but he's only there for three weeks. And the reason is because the Jewish people are that are members of the local synagogue there in Thessalonica are very angry with him because he's preaching that the Messiah has come and that this Jesus Christ who is crucified is the Messiah. And so they began to persecute Paul to such an extreme that he fled to Berea, which is a town a little bit further to the east, and, or I'm sorry, to the west. So uh, what's interesting, he's, only, he's there in Berea for a time, but the Jews here in Thessalonica, they hear that he's in Berea, they travel to Berea, and they give him all sorts of problems. Too much, so much that he has to flee to Athens which is much more open to new and exotic ideas. So they're not really interested in starting a riot because someone is preaching something new. 
Now, because the church had only been there for three weeks, Paul made sure that Timothy and another disciple stayed behind to help with the church, to help it grow, to preach and to teach. But there were problems, so Timothy decided for a report and to give a report, so he traveled to Berea, discovered that Paul had gone on to Athens, he goes to Athens, and he tells Paul about the problems that are going on in the, in the church at Thessalonica. And they are, they have very confusing ideas about the resurrection of the dead. They're having very confusing ideas about the second coming of Christ. And also they're really struggling because they used to be pagans. Now their lives have changed because they, want, they are Christians. And so how do you live in a city which wants you to be pagan and is built around pagan principles. How do you live like that? So Paul writes a letter, sends Timothy back. You know what we call that letter? First Thessalonians. So Timothy gets there. He, the letters spread around and read. There's still some problems. So Timothy goes back. And Paul has to write a second letter. And guess what we call that letter? Second Thessalonians. Timothy goes back and delivers the church. And the church was able to prosper and grow in a place that was completely built around pagan principles. The advice that he gives them on how to live in a pagan city applies to us today in the year of our Lord 2020. Because we are living in a culture that is in flux. We are living in a culture of extremely civilized pagans. Pagans who wear neckties and carry briefcases, or at the very least, iPhones. And so how do we as a church, who shares a worldview that is biblical and holy, how do we minister to those around us? How do we share Christ? How do we just live? Well, I went to 1 Thessalonians and I got this great advice from the Apostle Paul that he wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to share that with you this morning. I would like you please to open your bulletins because I have my sermon notes in there. And I apologize to those who are watching on video. I could go like this, but that doesn't help. So, but nonetheless, let me, let's go over this because the way that I have this verse formatted is very important. I'm reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 to 22. We urge you, brethren, shame the unruly, shame the faint-hearted, shame the weak, be impatient with everyone. Did I read it right? I didn't read it right? What? Okay. It doesn't say that. What it says, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I do not deal in shame. You've heard me say this before. The reason I don't deal in shame is because what shame says is you are the action that you have done and there is no repentance there is no reconciliation there is no forgiveness for you are your action and you will never change that is not the gospel that's the world's gospel that is Satan's gospel and we don't truckle with that type of manipulation because that is exactly what shame is. Because shame is a chain that holds us down to the past because of actions that we have done. Now guilt is something that God uses. I don't deal with guilt. I trust the Holy Spirit. I do not need to preach hellfire and brimstone 
because I feel no need to manipulate you emotionally. If you feel shame while I'm preaching, that is not coming from Pastor Craig. That is coming from your past. That is coming from voices that you've heard in your past. That is coming from a place that is very hot and smells of sulfur. You need to take that to God and get it taken care of. You can come to me. Because knowing what God has forgiven me, I know what God can forgive, that God can definitely forgive anything that is causing you shame. Now guilt, by the way, is something different. It means you have done something, but it can be forgiven. And this is the problem that I have with social movements that are going on today. Have you noticed there is no talk of reconciliation? There is no talk of forgiveness. There is only talk of revenge. Therefore, these social movements have already lost. Because in order for a social movement, and if you'll forgive me, I want to I want to compare Christianity as a, for a moment to a social movement. It's far more than that, but let me use that model. What does Christianity offer? Forgiveness, reconciliation, restitution, the ability to stand before God with a face, to be blessed. In the social movements that we're seeing today, are we seeing blessing? No. I don't see any blessing going on. I see a lot of cursing. And that is not what the church is supposed to do. That is the world's job, and the world does it very well. Don't try and do the, what the world is doing. What it says here, admonish the unruly. The word admonish is an old word that we don't use that much anymore. It means to warn or reprimand someone firmly, but in love and encouragement, knowing that we are talking about... We are stressing the fact that there is forgiveness, there is reconciliation. So we admonish the unruly, those who, have, who, who are out of control, those who are causing disturbances. We encourage the faint-hearted. We don't shame them. The faint-hearted are those people who are lacking courage or timid. And we encourage them. We let them know that you can feel fear and still live the Christian life. You can feel fear and still do the right thing. You can, feel, you can feel fear and still go to those who are violently involved in other social movements and you can share the Lord Jesus Christ with them in kindness and in love and in mercy and in patience, and in grace, and you can only do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. You, if you try to do that without the help of the Holy Spirit, you're done. You're, you're in serious weeds. So, you know, when we, when we, when we encourage the, the faint-hearted, we let them know that they can do all things through Christ who is going to strengthen them. We help the weak. We don't shame the weak. We don't shoot our wounded. We help them. We help them as best we can because eventually all of us are going to be weak in some way, shape, or form. And there is weakness that all of us face in our lives. The weak are also those that are dealing with self-defeating, self-destructive behaviors. Those that are dealing and struggling with temptation. We don't shame them. We help them. We pray with them. We come along beside them. The paraclete is the name that we call the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is referred to as the paraclete, the one who walks beside. We use that word para in our own English language. A paramedic is someone who comes along a medic. A paralegal is someone who comes beside a legal. A parakeet is someone who comes beside a keet. Never, never mind. 
I just, want, I just said that to see if you were awake, okay? But the paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit, comes alongside us and helps us. And that is our job as well, that we are to be a form of a paraclete, that we come along beside an anamchara, that, an, an old Celtic word for soul friend. And we love those people and we help them and we strengthen them with our prayers and with our encouragement. And we're patient with everyone. I am not a role model for patience. When it comes to patience, don't look at me. But I do know that God is making me better in that because I realize that I have a problem. It's not just who I am. It's not me trying to cover it up. I know that being impatient is not something that glorifies God. It doesn't glorify God at all. Therefore, I ask God for help to be patient. And be patient with everyone. What does that mean? Able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. And if being annoyed or anxious was a spiritual gift, I win. But unfortunately, it's not. Okay? So, we all need to pray for patience. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Oh, wow. Think of various social movements that are going on right now. How do they want to repay evil? I, by the way... Don't get me wrong, I do believe, and I will always believe, because this is the United States of America, I believe in peaceful protest. I have no problem with peaceful protest. I may not agree, but I will always support a peaceful protest. I will not support, I will not support rioting, or the burning down of buildings, or the destruction of people's homes and businesses. That I will not support. I will not repay evil with evil because my Lord Jesus Christ has commanded that I not do that. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. There is a gentleman on the internet, his last name is Davis. He's a Christian. He has done an amazing ministry. He's black, and he goes to KKK rallies. And what he does, he's, he just talks to people. His testimony is nothing short of amazing. So far, he's gotten 200 people to come out of the Ku Klux Klan. 200 have put aside their robes and are no longer involved in white supremacy movement. Why? Because he seeks first to understand and then to be understood. He got the head wizard in the KKK that was overseeing all of the United States of America. He got that guy to come out of the Ku Klux Klan. It took him a couple of years. But you know what? He never thought, saw him as an enemy. He saw him first as a human being. And it's an amazing, an amazing video. I would encourage you to watch it. He goes a TED Talk and he has some other videos that are available as well. So he does not repay evil for evil, but always seeks after that which is good for one another and for all people. He is a living testimony that offering forgiveness and reconciliation to offer peace and blessing works better than offering cursing and shaming and destruction. Now the next one, this, this whole section here is all one sentence. I used to think that it only applied to number three. And everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But in studying this, I realized that all three of those, of those situations that are being described 
are all one thing, and all of them are described as the will of God. So if this is God's will, this is what God wants us to do as followers of Christ. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And all three of these things, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now when I was growing up, I used to struggle with that verse. Rejoice always. I stub my toe and I'm to rejoice. Something horrible happens to me, I'm rejoice. I get sick and I'm supposed to rejoice. I mean, what kind of ogre is God anyway? Until I learn that rejoicing is not an emotion. Listen to me. Rejoicing is not an emotion. Happiness is an emotion. But rejoicing is a decision. Rejoicing is a way of looking at things in a completely different way. That even in the midst of living in a world that is subject to the law of entropy, that is subject to evil things, that is subject to all that's going around and falling down around us, that even in the midst of the year of our Lord 2020, which I don't know about you guys, but 2020 has not been good to me. If you remember, I spent the first month and a half of 2020 flat on my back and in a rehab center and living in incredible pain. And then when I got up, COVID-19, just in time for COVID-19. Yay! And now we have all these social movements that are going on. Yay! All sorts of things are happening. 2020 is not going to be my year. I have no idea what's coming up next. I'm, I'm suspecting Godzilla. Okay? So, that's just me. But anyway, all of that aside, I know that regardless of what happens, God wants me to rejoice. What does rejoicing mean? It means that we've read the last page of the Bible. Guess who's sideways? We do. Guess who... There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guess who that applies to? Me. Also applies to you, by the way, but applies to me. There's no condemnation. Because I'm in the Lord, I'm in Christ Jesus. No created thing can pluck me from the hand of God because I'm engraved in the palm of his hand in the form of a nail print. So are you. Don't you forget that. So are you. To remember that God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? That even in the midst of persecution, which we do not have in the United States in any way, shape, or form, seriously. We don't have it right now. Not compared to our brothers and sisters in China, and the Middle East, some parts of Africa. We don't have, we're not persecuted. We have freedom. And we rejoice in that because that means that we're still able to spread the gospel freely. Let's take good advantage of that. But rejoicing is an understanding of who and what we are. The next one's a tough one if you don't understand it. Pray without ceasing. Does that mean 24 hours a day that we do nothing but pray? That's what monks and nuns do, right? So we should pray without ceasing. Let me explain exactly what that means. You guys eat without ceasing. You know that? Every day you eat, it may be one meal, two meal, or three meals, or 30. But it doesn't matter how many meals you eat per day, you eat without ceasing. That means, And praying without ceasing means that we're praying every day. I've trained myself that when I hear a siren, I immediately pray. Not only for the people that are in that vehicle, regardless of what it is, but for the situation that they're going to. I'm not saying you have to do that, I'm just saying that I've trained myself. When I encounter a situation out in the world that I don't know how to deal with, I pray immediately. The ability to pray should be something that we first think about, not something that's second or third or fourth, but the first thing that we do is we, and even if it's just a silent cry, of, God help. So we pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks. It doesn't say for everything give thanks, but in everything. I, at Mount Olivet today, I was shaking, I was not shaking hands because we're not allowed to shake hands, but I was greeting people as they were coming in and giving them their bulletin. And I said to one of the 
lady's walking in. I said, it's so good to see you today. How are you doing? And she says, well, I'm above ground. Okay, that's something to be grateful for. We're all above ground today. Do you know that there's about a thousand people that are not above ground today? So, but I'm above ground, you're above ground, and we can praise God for that, right? And then we can count our blessings. And if you were to count your blessings, you would be amazed how many reams of paper you could fill up. We, we worry about the things that we don't have. Do you know that we are the wealthiest, even the poorest people in the United States, when compared to the rest of the world, are still the wealthiest people in the world? They're still the wealthiest people in the world. We have so much wealth in this country. No, we're not millionaires. Some of us aren't even thousandaires. Okay? But we are still very wealthy people for which we can give thanks. And the fact that we can share that and with other countries and other people who are in need and share our abundance with them. Why? Because this is God's will. For those who are in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. God wants us to do this. And so we do. But I want to make one thing very clear. Our reliance on the Holy Spirit is paramount. You can do none of these things without reliance on the Holy Spirit. I really need to stress that. You'll say, Pastor Craig... You say that practically every sermon. I'll, come, I'll say it until Shiloh come. Because we need to understand how important it is that we rely on the Holy Spirit. Jesus did nothing apart from the Father. And we should do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. Asking the Holy Spirit every day, waking up and saying, Holy Spirit, this morning, help me. Today, help me to live a life which honors you and the Son, and the Father. Part of that praying without ceasing type thing. Because when we pray that, things happen. Because we are spiritual people who are involved in the supernatural. I'm not saying that, you know, all sorts of weird and odd things are going to happen like we see on TV or we hear on certain televangelist programs, but I'm saying that our lives become easier to live. And, and we learn how to rejoice, and we learn how to praise, and we learn how to pray, and we learn all the disciplines of the Christian faith. God helps us with temptation, self-defeating behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, but it, it requires... That we rely completely on the Holy Spirit. That means that we read God's word. That we do not forsake the gathering of the brethren and sisters. That we, we, we remember what it implies. What it means to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And very important. I want you to learn one thing. This is not make sure your dress is less than two inches above your knee. Okay? Don't get a tattoo. We don't smoke. We don't chew. We don't go with women who do. These are not rules. All of this deals with relationships. Relationships. That is what Christianity is all about. Not a religion of do's and don'ts. It's a religion, a worldview, a paradigm. It is a lifestyle of relationships. Our relationship with God is paramount. When we have our relationship with God right, we understand who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We start to peel back that shame we start to get rid of the guilt as we bring it to the cross. We understand who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as our relationship with God improves, our relationship with ourself improves. Because we know who we are. And who you are is very important. 
because you will live out who you are. All of you have a self-image. And you will live up to that self-image. If your self-image is not based on scripture, is not based on how God sees you, and some of you have really bad theology. Some of you have no idea Romans chapter 8 is even in your Bible. Or if you read Romans chapter 8, you either don't believe it, or you hear this voice that says, oh, isn't those cute words, what a pity it doesn't apply to you. Romans 8 applies to all of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the self-image that we are to have. All based on what Christ has done, not what we have done. Based on what Christ has done. Because what Christ has done cannot be unchanged. Therefore, because what Christ has done is eternal, therefore, how we are described is eternal. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that definition does not apply to you, and you've got to accept the world's definition your experience's definition, others' definition, your damaged definition. You need the Bible, and you need to get that relationship with God straight to understand who He is, what he, that He loves us, that He's not angry at any of us. And then we get this straight in here, and you get to look in the mirror and you say, that is a child of God because of what God has done. Not anything I've done, but because of what God has done. And then guess what? Relationship with God, relationship with self. And then it starts pouring out into the horizontal relationships. And that is relationships with everybody else. And they start to improve. I hate to say this, but it is true. If your horizontal relationships stink, it's because you're goofing up your relationship with God or you're goofing up your relationship with yourself. You're not allowing your relationship with God to affect the way that you have a relationship with yourself. You've got to get those taken care of. How do you do that? Very simple. God... I want a better relationship with you. That's, that's how you start. That's all you got to say. Lord, I want a better relationship with you. Show me what it means. What, what does Romans chapter 8 mean? What does John chapter 3 mean? What does John chapter 4 mean? What, do, what does the Bible mean when it, when it speaks to us? And once you get that taken care of, and you, and you do that, then your horizontal relationships begin to prosper. I really think that that is probably the philosophy behind every good Christian marriage seminar. But not only marriage, but with any relationship, whether it be business or children or just the people that we bump into on the street. But I want to encourage you. I really want to encourage you all it takes is for you to go to God and be honest. Hold yourself up by the scruff of the neck and say, Lord, this is what I am. And he'll say, I've known that all along. I was waiting for you to acknowledge it. Now let's, now let's buckle down and let's get, start, let's get the work started. And it will take you the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm working on things that are 50, 60 years old. That's okay. God's a great heart surgeon. He would like not only the operation to be a success, he'd like the patient to live. So, if God takes his time with you, hey, my canoe is huge. Jump on in. Welcome home. I have a canoe of imperfect Christians. If you're perfect, there's no room in my canoe for you. But if you're imperfect, boy, have I got some great news for you. I got a nice, comfortable seat. And we'll just paddle together. And 
We'll make it. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Because He's the author and finisher of our faith, and the Holy Spirit has sealed us Jonah until the day of redemption. He'd been involved in reverse growth quite a bit, and these songs are actually probably going to be new for you. So, and he's going to give a little testimony as he feels free. First one is praise your name. Yeah, I I decided today to show you a little bit of what uh, we do at camp and what each song mean, means to us at camp. This song especially as we wake up as cabin leaders, we, during our training week, we were always, um, we were being prepared, we were being armored in, in, a, in a strength that so we can sing our way out of the valley, so we can shout our way up to the mountain, because especially with COVID, we're going to have a lot of storms, we're going to have a lot of uh, troubles that, sadly, um, are, are definitely going to come. So, this just is a definite reminder as a, a different prayer when we wake up. So... Oh 
gonna praise, I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna put through to every light crumble. I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain. I'm gonna rest in the arms of the Father. I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise you. They ask questions we can't figure out, we can't, we have no clue. This is um, where Jesus comes in. All our strength with whatever we're doing, uh, we hope to point it back to God. And, and it's only Jesus through us that we can take the next step to uh, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to take a kid to the bathroom. Which, to be honest, is uh, another great time to minister. Uh, one of our good friends um, uh, led Camp to Christ uh, in a bathroom. You can lead, you can show God anywhere. And this one just really hits home that way. So. Really wish to be more like Jesus. Oh 
This last song applies to me uh, very much as counselor, counselor uh, or a cabin leader as um, I'm going to bed. Because a lot of times, as cabin leaders, you're um, always doing what Cole calls analyzing. You're always looking back. You're always looking back at what could I have done better with the kids. What? Because I don't believe there's ever a perfect solution, but uh, you can always make it better. And a lot of times when I look back um, on a horrible day, I'll realize the goodness of God. I'll realize how faithful He has been um, through it all. Whether I, I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now. And sometimes I don't even. His ways are higher uh, than, than ours. So... It's, it's just a really big testimony, testimony to see God's faithfulness throughout every day. So. Thank you. 